what I'm going to talk about today is the area of my research. And to do that, I want us all just to go back in time a little bit, both from the sorts of things that Professor Burrow was talking about with you guys, but also a little bit back into your own lives. And I want you to think about some of the sorts of things that were going on and happening to you a few years ago when you guys were in middle school. Um, and that's really what I study is puberty. Do you want to? Wow, I have my very own Vanna White, too. Um, <laughs> puberty. And I think that a question that I often get a lot is, why on earth, as a psychologist, would you care about puberty? Um, and the main reason for that is that I'm really curious and really inspired by how people navigate changes in their lives. How do they come to terms with the fact that life is different from the way it always used to be? And the thing that's really interesting for me about puberty is that after infancy, this is the greatest period of change we ever have in our lives. And it's change across all domains, not just biological, but also social and emotional and cognitive. And unlike infancy, people are far more cognizant of all of those changes of puberty as they're occurring. And I think that it's perhaps this conscious awareness of change that marks puberty as different and maybe why puberty is associated with a lot of psychological distress. At a basic level, we see that across the board, psychological problems tend to go up for people at puberty. They are endemic and widespread. And we see that in a few ways. We see that for some people, this is the first time they ever begin to have psychological difficulty or difficulty managing and navigating their emotions. For others, we see that they may have always struggled throughout their lives, but that this is a time of worsening or exacerbating of those problems. And then even at a whole population-wide level, we see some really curious things happen. Prior to puberty, we actually see higher rates of a lot of psychological problems in boys than we do in girls. And it's once we get to puberty, by about the midpoint, we see a flip-flopping in that ratio, and particularly for disorders like depression and anxiety. We see that after puberty, there's about a two to three times greater ratio in females than in males, and that exists for the rest of the lifespan. So what I really focus on and what I really study is the fact that at puberty, there is a lot of individual variability. There are a lot of different ways that people can experience this transition. And the curious thing is that those different ways that the transition is experienced actually matter a lot for the psychological experience that people have during that time. So the biggest way that puberty differs across people is when it happens. Um, so when do kids mature relative to their peers of the same age and same gender? We call this pubertal timing, and it can give us a gauge of whether people are maturing earlier on time or later than the rest of the bell curve. A lot of people have studied, thank you, pubertal timing. And we know that in girls, early pubertal timing is really important and really worrisome. We know that it's associated with the increased risk or increased vulnerability for a lot of problems, including depression and anxiety, which I mentioned, but also disordered eating, delinquency, substance use and abuse, school failure, and peer sexual harassment and sexual victimization. So we see much higher rates of sexual trauma and sexual victimization in early maturing girls relative to girls who mature on time. Okay, so this is a tough slide. I will take this one on. So why is early maturation so, thank you, Kayla, so perilous for girls? Um, there are a lot of hypotheses, and nobody is really sure, but most of them center on this mismatch between physical appearance and social and emotional maturation. These are kids who look considerably older than they are and are often mistaken for being older than they are, but they still have the mind of this children who look the children of their same age who look much younger. So, their advanced physical appearance is believed to make it difficult to maintain friendships with girls of the same age who may not have matured at the same time. Because they look much older than they are, oh, it may make it more difficult for them to maintain that very idealized thin body type that tends to be overemphasized in media. Because they look older than they are, they often attract the attention of older men. And this is believed to be a pivotal mechanism because it increases the accessibility to alcohol. 
increases likelihood of either consensual or non-consensual sexual intercourse, and it opens girls up to hanging around with the sort of peer group who may be engaging in delinquent and acting out activities that tend not to occur until later in adolescence, kind of like right around where you guys are now, actually. Now, as I mentioned earlier, sorry guys, um, because there's this mismatch between physical, social, and emotional maturation, um, it can, it's believed that all of these things couple together to make this pubertal time really difficult for these girls. So another way that puberty can differ across kids is in how quickly it happens. We call this pubertal tempo, which is a term I hate, it makes me sound like I'm you know, conducting a pubertal symphony, but that's not actually what it is. It's simply a gauge of how quickly does it take you to go from the early part of the transition to the end of it. And there's a lot of variability in this. It can take as little as a year to a year and a half, or it can take as many as eight or nine years, with most, girl, uh, most kids taking about four to four and a half years on average. One of the things that I'm curious about is, does it matter how quickly it happens? At a basic level, we know that adapting to rapid change is more difficult at all times in our life and with lots of different scenarios than more gradual change. And so it occurs to me that maturing very quickly might demand a very, very quick adaptation to all of the new social and biological milestones that kids are going to encounter at this age. And it may generate different reactions from people in the world around kids. If they see from parents and teachers and friends, if they see these dramatic changes in a kid very quickly, the social world has to adapt too. And it may be the case that very rapid pubertal tempo means kids mature more rapidly than the social world can really feasibly adapt. And so that is the prelim to what I study. And one of the things that my work has shown is that, you can go ahead and click through the two stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, early pubertal timing in my work replicates all of what the rest of the field has seen. We see that girls who mature ahead of their peers are at increased risk or increased vulnerability for greater anxiety, greater depression, and difficulty getting along with girls of the same age. In boys, the situation is a little different, however. It seems that both early pubertal timing and maturing very quickly are really important for boys and associated with greater declines in mood and greater difficulties getting along with peers. And that pattern is opposite the typical pattern for boys in the sample that I studied. For most of those boys, puberty actually was a time of flourishing for them, believe it or not. They tended to get along better with others. They tended to show increases in mood, improvements in anxiety levels. But boys who matured early or boys who matured very, very quickly did not show those typical transitions. I think the discrepancy between boys and girls may have to do with the fact that girls mature on average before boys. They start puberty about a year to a year and a half earlier. So I think for that reason, the early effect may be something of a trumping effect because they're starting it so much ahead of everyone else. So I'm also not the first person to discover this. Um, this is one of these classic cases of psychologists replicating what a lot of people already know. I particularly like this quote from the comedian Tina Fey, who has written quite a lot about her experiences with early puberty, and she says, Growing up as a girl is always traumatizing, especially when you have the deadly combination of greasy skin and getting your boobs at 10. But I think it's good to grow up that way. Builds character. <laughs> so that's a lot of the focus of my past research. Where I'm going next has a lot to do with changes in puberty across a population. How many of you guys have heard that puberty is getting younger than it used to be? Yeah, many, not all, but many of you guys. It is. It's starting a lot earlier than it has historically. The time when it ends is not changing. So what that means is that kids today are actually starting puberty younger and spending a progressively longer period of their lives during this really important transition. And what I'm curious about is if these changes in the timing and the duration of puberty may mean that puberty is a more vulnerable time 
and more important psychological time for kids today than for kids in the past. And I have 50 years worth of data on kids' experiences during puberty that I'm analyzing to try and understand and answer that exact same question. Does it mean something different to grow up today than it did in the 1970s or 1960s when things started a little bit later? So thank you. I want to thank you guys all for your time. And I will be sure to tell you or tell Professor Williams and pass on to you more about what I learn in that study on um, the history of puberty. But I believe we have a few time for questions. Before you take the questions, can you describe to them the data set that you're working with, the 50-year data set? It, it, it's, Just so they understand what you're okay. you So that. I have, so I'm using a really new statistical technique. It's um, not one that's often been used. And it allows you to combine five different data sets into one. There's some advantages about that. The data sets, they have to match up on certain parameters, which mine do. That was the biggest part of it. There's also a lot of, there's a little more drama associated with using historical data than I had anticipated. Some of it's not digitized. Um, some of it, they lost the code books that tell you what the variables are. <laughs> and so there's a whole set of those that are just data that's just out of commission for me. But I'm putting all five data sets together using this new technique and hoping to analyze them in tandem with each other. So there are a few advantages to this. It's really good for assessing between study set differences, which will help us understand cohort trends. But it also extends the age range of participants that we, are, we can study. And it increases the frequency of low base rate behaviors and clinical symptoms. Um, so there are going to be more of them in this big data set than there would be in each individual small one.